ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Kathy Swift. Now, uh, Kathy is uh, from the University of Limerick. She runs the Irish Studies Teaching Program in Mary Immaculate College, University of Limerick. Um, she is an MPhil uh, in Archaeology at the University of Durham, a second MPhil in Old Irish Language and Culture from Trinity College, Dublin. Her DPhil at Oxford examined the history of the cult of St. Patrick. She has taught in many universities, served 10 years as organizing secretary of the Irish Conference of Medievalists, and runs summer schools in Old Irish in Limerick, when she's not off gallivanting across Europe with her pilgrim staff, knapsack, and tent. So we're great, it's great that we actually caught her in between one of those trips to actually talk to us here today at Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2015. Could you all please give Kathy Swift a warm welcome? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good, okay. Um, what this paper is, it was started by a conversation I had with Elizabeth, who spoke yesterday about the Munster Irish Project. And she was saying that um, the clans of Ireland had expressed an interest in having a project about the words used to describe clans and the different terms that are used. And so that's where this paper began, as an attempt to look at the historiography of how we have described clans. And in the last, uh, or in the paper before last, um, uh, uh, Joseph was saying that uh, Irish language um, material is not always as prominent as maybe it should be in our discussions of Ireland's past. And um, hopefully he'll, he'll, he'll improve, uh, approve of this paper because I'm going to be concentrating mainly on Irish language material. Okay? But I'm starting with the period, uh, the Victorian period, because that was the time when Irish people first started discussing who were the, the, uh, their ancestors, what structures existed as professional historians. Okay? Um, it started, it was a group led by the Ordnance Survey people in the 1830s and 40s, and it then grew uh, as part of the sort of background to the Gaelic League and, and the growth of nationalism. So I start with G. H. Orpen, who did a, a, a very lengthy six-volume discussion of uh, Ireland under the Normans. And he says, before the Normans, this is page one, Ireland was in a tribal state. Okay? The allegiance of the freeborn Irishman was given in the first place to his head of family, his kindred, uh, or, or sept. And then he translates the word sept with the Irish word finna. Then through the family head, the Kyan Inna, to the chief of the tribe, uh, of which his family formed an element related by real or supposed remoter kinship and connected by common ownership of land. Okay, so there's all sorts of interesting things in that description. Um, the word sept, the fact that the word sept is made equivalent to the Irish word finna, um, the common ownership of land, and the notion that kinship might be supposed rather than real, okay? Also, the word tribal, which I'll be coming back to. Orpen was really discussing, the, as I say, Ireland under the Normans, um, somebody whose concentration was on pre-Norman Ireland uh, of roughly the same period was a guy called P.W. Joyce, who was a school teacher from County Limerick. And in his account, uh, written in, in 1903, published in 1903, he talks about the people of Ireland were formed into groups of various sizes from the family upwards. So the family was the group consisting of living parents and all their descendants, what we might call the nuclear family today. The sept, for Joyce, was a larger group descended from common parents long since dead. But this is an important word brought into use in comparatively late times. I'll come back to that. And then he goes on and he says, all members of a sept were nearly related, that is to say closely related, and in later times they all bore the same surname. Above that, he sees the clan, or which he, trans he, he equivalents to something he calls a house. 
clan means children, and the word therefore implied descent from one ancestor. And above that again, as the greater umbrella term, the tribe, which he makes equivalent to Tuas, was made up of several sets, clans or houses. And generally speaking, he says, also was thought to come from a common ancestor. So he's very much focused on common ancestry as the, as the key underlying all the structures. But it underlies the biggest umbrella structure, the Tuas, and then all the substructures again underneath that. And then he goes on and he says, the theory of common descent became a fiction, except for the leading families who preserved their descent pure and kept a careful record of their genealogy. And thus, the tribe, over time, became a mere local association of people occupying a specific district and bound together by common customs, common interests, living under one ruler, and in some degree, some degree, by the fiction, fiction of descent from one common ancestor. Okay? So that's quite a specific model. Um, it's an interestingly specific, given that Joyce is writing very much at the beginning of the discussion of all this, and unfortunately, like a lot of our Victorian writers, he doesn't give you any footnotes. So um, you, he, it's a lovely model, but you need to know what's underlying it. Yeah? Along came Owen McNeill. Owen McNeill was the first professor of early Irish history in UCD. He was also the guy who famously did not call out the volunteers in 1916. He was also the guy who was in charge of the Boundary Commission when Northern Ireland was set up. So he had a, an important political career. But for early Irish historians, he is the first uh, and the father of early Irish history. And again, he doesn't use footnotes, but he did set up an awful lot of the models that we still work with and try and interpret. And in 1935, towards the end of his career, he wrote a book uh, called Early Irish Laws and Institutions, in which he excoriated, in particular, the word tribe. Um, he, really, he, was, he, he really didn't like the word tribe because he felt it was used by people to, uh, to belittle early Irish society. And he felt that the English word tribe had negative connotations. Okay, and it's quite interesting even today when you look at, listen to newspaper reportage, for example, when they use the word tribe, it's nearly always of a people with whom we're at war. Yeah? So it, it, is, it does tend to be quite a negative word. I would, I would agree with McNeil on that. On the specifics, he says, Joyce does not tell us what Irish words corresponded to sept and clan, although he does print these as technical terms in heavy type with capital initials. And he then goes on to talk about other uh, scholars, mainly British scholars, um, who use the word clan, and according to McNeil anyway, are relying on descript fictional descriptions of Highland clans in Scotland by Sir Walter Scott. Okay. If you look up the, the word sept, which has already appeared a couple of times, this is um, used extensively, even now by modern uh, early Irish genealogists, they continue to use this word. When you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, they say it first appears in an Irish context uh, to describe a clan structure, um, and it originates in the 16th century, so in the Elizabethan period. Now, um, the Elizabethan period is long beyond my normal arena of operations. So, I, I have one text, but as somebody said yesterday, one source is never enough. Uh, and I have written to my tutor colleagues to ask them for further, for, for, do they have further information on this. But at the moment I'm dealing, I have one text uh, on the O'Sullivans of Bera. And this is a, do a document about an argument over, over land. But it says, the count countries of Bera and Bantry contain 60 quarters of land, and every quarter contains three plowlands. And the bishopric of Cork owns eight quarters, 
and certain freeholders, that is to say subordinate groups, own 33 quarters. So about half the land belongs to freeholders and half the land um, belongs to others. And they say the only land belonging to O'Sullivan and all of his sept in Bear and Bantry are 19 quarters. And O'Sullivan has, in continued and settled estate, only five quarters. And the remaining 19 is divided between him and the people of his sept or his close relatives. Okay? And this varies over time uh, depending on the size of how many relatives he's got at any given moment. Okay? And in the same document, which as you can see is written in 1593, it goes on to say that the domain lands belonging to O'Sullivan in the country of Bera, um, together with the rents and services and lawful duties and so forth, um, it names the freeholders. And you can see from the list, these are people of alternative surnames. So in this structure, we have an O'Sullivan chief, we have O'Sullivan close relatives, who are called the Sept, who have land which comes and goes between them and the chief, and then we have the freeholders who are named by other surnames. And um, this goes back to what Elizabeth was saying yesterday about the fact that um, some people worry about perhaps a surname was used for all the tenant farmers on land controlled by a chief. Well, this text suggests no, the tenant farmers kept their own surnames and it was just the chief and the chief's close relatives who bore the single surname. But it's only one text. I'll be back next year with more, hopefully. And you may have picked up that between what Orpen says and what Joyce says and what McNeil says, there are contradictions. Okay? So my first point is that the Victorian writers, the people who started our field of, ge uh, of modern studies of Irish genealogies, um, have left us an, inheritant, an inheritance of various English terms to describe the structures of Irish families. And they're not, they're not all mutually consistent. They're not closely defined. These were pioneers. Um, and we can't rely, we do tend, by the nature of things, there aren't very many scholars of early Ireland, it's one of my big bugbears, uh, we tend to pay for engineers in this country rather than for, for uh, early Irish scholarship, but um, we can't rely on what the Victorians did as giving us um, the, the final answer. Okay, they were only, it was only the beginning. So that's the descriptive, the narrative accounts that we've inherited about Irish families and Irish tribes and Irish clans. What about the actual vocabulary? Well, we do have dictionaries. We have two major dictionaries. The first of these is the glossary to the ancient laws of Ireland. And this was produced by the Rolls series of Great Britain uh, in 1901. There were six volumes and it was an, ac an account of Breton law as known at that stage. Um, now this project had a certain number of um, hiccups like all big projects. Um, the two people who were, who were majorly involved in the beginning were the two great Victorian scholars John O'Donovan and Eugene O'Curry. But they both died tragically young in 1863. And the project was then taken up by a committee. Okay? And like camels, um, this committee produced something which satisfied very few people. Okay? Because there was too many people and they weren't majorly involved in, 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 early, in Irish language scholarship. And there's inconsistencies between the different volumes and so forth and so forth. So nowadays, scholars of Breton law tend to be quite dismissive and there are a lot of negative comments made about the, uh, the ancient laws of Ireland as a project and as a publication. 
but they left us a glossary and that glossary has fed into an awful lot of the secondary literature. Okay? And one of the things you get from the glossary is that there are a number of different terms which are used in Irish to describe families and clan structures. So I start with the word finna, which in the glossary is described as a tribe. You remember Orpen used it to describe the sept. And then he goes on to say, well, I'm calling it a tribe, but actually if you read the other five volumes, you'll see we mostly translated it by the word family. These, these kind of things don't help. Yeah? Um, I, he then has a discussion about a particular problem, and then he says, in the Breton Law text, mention is made of four finna, that is to say the gel finna, the dera finna, the ear finna, and the in finna. And these are groupings that work together. Um, but this subdivision is not explained in detail in what we have in front of us. So that's one word that's used to describe a uh, structure. Another, the word clan, interestingly, is hardly described at all. It just says progeny or descendants, and it's left at that. Okay, it doesn't turn up very often in the, in the, in the Breton law that was published in the ancient laws. The word tuath is the people of a country who are ruled by a king. And for that reason, because there is always a king, a lot of Irish historians, most Irish historians now don't translate it at all. They just simply say tuatha or tuath and they leave a go at that. Um, but if you have to translate it, people either go for very neutral comments like community or else they go for kingdom. Okay. We tend not in the modern era to use the word tribe, although there is this Victorian inheritance of using that. Kennel is translated in the glossary as race, generation, kind, or again tribe. Okay. Kinyad is generation, birth, issue, and sometimes tribe. Cleothra, cleoth is a word meaning a, um, a rafter, when you have a roof, okay, you have rafters. Um, and ara is the word for, like, a, the, our word for, a modern word for minister, so it's somebody who is a rafter, somebody who supports the chief, okay. And this, so a, a supporting guy, and, and this seems to be a term which is used specifically, according to the glossary, of a sept, close relations who share the same, same surname as the chief, um, perhaps implying special obligations on those parts. Then you have the word doll, which is a division, a sept or a tribe, pheasant of a sept or a tribe, and then our, our old friend Finna that we heard of before, used again the four divisions, the Gel Finna, three generations, the Dera Finna, the Ir Finna and the In Finna, consisting four, five, and six generations, respectively. But this too can be used, according to Atkinson, as progeny, descendants, clan, tribe, or race. So what we're getting out of this is a, and, and I think this is a consequence of the way the ancient laws was published and came into being, um, there are different people translated different terms by a much smaller pool of English terms. Okay? And nobody went back and sort of investigated the specific Irish words in their specific context to try and get specific meanings out of them. These are more words here. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, but you'll notice the second one, officiel. That's a loan word from Romance language, from, either from um, Anglo-Norman French, as it was spoken in the colony, probably. Um, and then you have slandered which is the act of naming, and this gives a rise to the term slinche, and, and slinche is the term that we use nowadays for surnames. So if you know Porrick de Wolf's book on the surnames of, of, of Ireland, the Irish title is slinche Gaelogus Garol. And then we have the O word, okay? Originally Ua, 
where you get the plural form E followed by the genitive of the ancestral name. So it's Nile, but it's the E Nile, the descendants of Nile. Okay. And according to Professor McNeil, okay. um, these belong to these E names belong to a later fashion of nomenclature than collective names. The the names like um, uh, Connachta or the line, the Leinsterman. Okay. And then he gives a, a quite detailed description of an article Professor McNeil wrote in 1911, which I'll leave, I'll leave to one side. But when McNeil revisited these problems in 1935, he said, these E names, they are, um, they are descendants of some ruler of the 10th century or of later date. And it is evident, says McNeil, that a clan originating in the 10th century, in the year 1000, could not have constituted the whole social community. And there must have been a lot of subordinates um, who met in assemblies uh, who did not belong to these surnames, these E surnames. Okay? And these er E surnames, he reckons, were only an aristocratic crust on the general population of Ireland. And then he talks specifically about what he calls the superior clans, with the, bit, the, the ones who are very powerful in medieval Ireland, people like the, with the surnames McCarthy and O'Sullivan. And he talks about how the, the fact that they had migrated from um, Cashel into the southwest of Ireland and that this must have happened in the 12th century under the O'Connor kings, high kings of Ireland. And again, he's talk, he says, these then represent an aristocratic upper stratum which is not connected by kinship with the community in general or with the free population of the local, pop uh, free element in the local population. Okay? So he's very clear that he sees all surnames as simply being rulers and not being the population at large. Now when we come to the Clans of Ireland website, they translate, they translate themselves not with the word clan, interestingly, but the Irish term they use is fincha, and this is the plural of a word finchu, meaning land, which is the hereditary possession of a member of a finna. I'm sorry for all these technical terms, but the point is that unless we start dealing with the technical terms, we don't really know what we're trying to deal with. Yeah? <coughs> and there's a fabulous, fabulous scholar called Fr Professor Fergus Kelly of Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies who has done more than anybody in the last 40 years to popularize early Irish uh, history and early Irish Breton law. And he describes Fincha as the land which comes under the control of a, of a large group or family. And he talks about the distinction between a person's inherited share of kin land which is Fincha, and land which he could acquire by dint of his own efforts as an individual. And clearly there was the prospect of both, but what you had inherited from your kin at your death was supposed to go back to your kin. And what you had acquired personally, a percentage was to go to your kin, but some of it could be handed down wherever you liked. Okay. So my second point is that there are a large number of terms in Irish, far more than exist in English. And really, we haven't gone through these in any systematic way. And um, the scholars of early, unfortunately, the way early Irish scholarship has worked is that early Irish language scholars tend to be very interested in the kind of questions that have come up today about Celts and Indo-European and connections outside Ireland. Um, but they haven't been as interested in the specifics of native institutions on this island. And the historians, I hate to say, for the most part, don't have Irish. So we, we haven't really got a proper dialogue going as yet on these issues. And really, it's people like you and the genetic genealogy uh, movement which is throwing this into very high relief. And we're suddenly realizing 
you know, there's an elephant in the room which we haven't discussed. <coughs> okay. The word clan, as used today, most people think of it in terms of its Scottish parallels. Okay. And again, when you look at Scottish history, uh, and, and I don't know if John Cleary is still here, but um, the, uh, uh, yes, well, I, 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 I'm saying this, I, I may be wrong here, okay? But um, most of the general works that I've seen on Scottish history don't discuss the nature of a clan in great detail. Um, for the same problem that it's written in Scots Gaelic and most historians in universities are English speaking only. But there is a very interesting account by an Alan McPherson of a Highland genealogy um, that was published in, in 1966. And this was a genealogy that was put together in the later 17th century after the Battle of Culloden and at a time when um, land holding and structures in Scotland were, um, and particularly in the Highlands, were under a great deal of pressure. Uh, similar to the fact that a lot of our genealogies happen again around 1650 because again we're, it's a time when people are under pressure and people are losing land and so forth. And this genealogy, it was, it was published, um, it was written by a guy who was a lawyer, okay? Um, and uh, it's based on three sons, so there's one ancestor who has three sons. And this guy died around 1350. And then the, the 17th century text goes down through the list of the descendants of each of the three sons. And it ends around 1704. And it lists approximately a thousand individual Macphersons, male and female, as well as some 200 non-Macpherson marriages. Okay? And the figures are roughly 750 males and 200 females, and over 300 marriages are recorded. So the author suggests that approximately a quarter of the actual Macpherson clan is being recorded. Now this is where I think it gets really interesting. He says, rather more than one third of the recorded marriages took place within the clan. Okay, so they intermarried. So you had Macphersons marrying Macphersons. They were in three separate geographical areas, but they intermarried with each other. Of 119 marriages within the clan, 40 are within the descendants of one brother. Okay? So very close into marriage, both geography and um, close kindred. Okay? If you were a chief, you tended to marry outside the clan. And indeed, if you were a man, you had a higher, percent, a higher likelihood of marrying outside the clan, generally with your neighbours. Okay? But Macpherson females were the ones who mostly married inside the clan structure. And he suggests that might be to make sure that Macpherson land didn't go off with a non-Macpherson male. Yeah, so it was kept within the clan. Now this is a very interesting description. Um, there are things in that which seem to parallel what we know of from early Ireland. In particular the notion that if um, you don't have male uh, inheritors, you marry the females to members of, of, of your family group to make sure the land doesn't go away. That, <laughs> Irish history could be written entirely from the subject of land, and that seems to be something that we have also in the early, early sources. <coughs> and it's also interesting that some of the terms which he uses, such as slicht up there, and, and dukas down here, Again, these are words which also, I mean, Scots Gaelic and, modern, and, and Irish are connected. Um, they share an awful lot of vo common vocabulary. There are question marks as to how many common institutions we share. Um, Scottish nationalism in the current era is, is, I mean, I've had arguments with people from Aberdeen who said I was an Irish imperialist for suggesting there could be Irish parallels for, for Scotland. But um, that's up for debate, yeah? But certainly the vocabulary is the same. 
And here is another example of the word schlicht used in a, a particularly in an Irish context. And you can see it's also used of a genealogy, um, uh, in this case, uh, Lachlan O'Donovan. I don't know, I'm not really an expert on the, on the 17th century and later genealogies, particularly the ones in English. I don't know of many examples from Ireland where we have the women recorded and the marriages recorded in such detail. So it's difficult to draw a parallel for that element in the Scottish, um, in the Scottish text. Although for me, that's one of the most interesting things about the Scottish text. I have got occasional references to women, and it's interesting they all tend to turn up in the 17th, late 16th and 17th century. So it seems to be a habit which is coming into Ireland at the end of the um, 16th, 17th century uh, period, about the same time. It, it coincides in date with the, with the Scottish material, but I don't know whether that's the full explanation. But the notion that you have multiple brothers who are the beginnings of the family tree, again, that's something which is very common, uh, endemic, in fact, in Irish genealogy. And this is perhaps our very earliest example. This is from a text um, written in the 680s AD, not 1680s, but 680s AD. It's written by a guy from just south of Killala in Mayo, and it's the Count of St. Patrick as he travels around the northern half of Ireland. And he talks about how somebody from his area is introduced to Patrick at Tara. And the question is posed, tell me your name, the name of your father, the name of your territory, and the name of your lands, and where your house is. And he replies, I am Enda, son of Avlongid, son of Fiacre, son of Echu, from the western district, Magdovnon, which is um, Eris, essentially, and the wood of Fokloth. And then he talks about how there are seven sons of Avlongid, um, and six of them... Um, Six of them did not accept Christianity, um, but Enda and his small son and Patrick were lined up on the side of the Christians. Okay? And they stood in front of the High King, and the High King made a decision, along with Patrick, they should divide their inheritance into seven parts. Patrick and the sons of Avlongid. So the sons of Avlongid in Mayo represent the seven districts under which the territory was controlled. And that's a text, as I say, from the end of the 7th century AD. So my third point is, am I still audible, yeah? yeah. Um, my third point is that the analysis of a 17th century Highland clan in Scotland does show features which are traditional also in Irish literature, and of course they do share a common Gaelic language culture. Um, but there are also some features in the Scottish material which can't be easily replicated in earlier Irish pedigrees, namely the, the position of women. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, because of the nature of this talk, there aren't many illustrations, so enjoy this, because it's one of the very few. Okay. Um, remember we talked about the finna, and this was the word which was most commonly associated with the English word sept, that is to say, the people who were closely related to this chief by sharing the same surname. Now, in Breton law, there are four groups of finna. Um, and essentially, they, uh, they go back, as earlier stated, to an ultimate ancestor, but the Breton lawyers knew that in terms of the reality of human existence, particularly in, in, in early medieval Ireland, um, you were unlikely to have three generations as adults living at any one time. Okay? So, um, if I'm, I'm, I'm the hero of this story, right? Okay? So that's me, my father, and my grandfather. Assume I'm male. Okay, for the purposes of this exercise, I'm male. So my father and my grandfather, my grandfather's other sons, that is to say my uncles, and my cousins, his sons. So the descendants of my grandfather, they are the members of the Gelfina, 
or the bright kindred. Okay, five groups. The Derevina go back to my great-grandfather. So apart from my direct ascendancy, there are also the great-uncles, and then there are the descendants, his sons, um, the sons of his sons, and the cousins. Okay? So that's the wider grouping. That's the Derevina. And there's up to nine different groups of them. Similarly, and I, I don't know the English vocabulary, I get into great cousins of great cousins and stuff like that. So, um, the next generation, you can see the principle, we're going back to an ancestor up there, my second ex, and we could include them. That brings me up to um, 13 different groups, and that's the ear finna, and then another group, set of groups here, and that's the infinna. Okay? Now, um, thank you. How did anybody, was anybody really interested? Did this have a practical application in everyday life? Or was it simply for discussing over the fire, you know, on extremely wet and gloomy days? Well, yes, it did. The Gelfina, the smallest group, becomes very popular, particularly in relation to inheriting office. So becoming a chief or becoming, uh, um, uh, uh, inheriting the role of Olive or Brehan of, of a group, that tended to be done within the Gelfina, the close family network. The slightly larger family network, the Derevina, this was the unit that seems to have been essentially the group that uh, took part in metal, the group that f functioned as a farming community. Okay? And each of the nine groups would have their own piece of land, but the lawyers suggest these pieces of land were all closely, you know, they were neighbors to each other, okay? And that when it came to plowing, or when it came to anything involving multiple, um, requiring multiple people involved in labor, then it was the Derevina was the group that, that, of kindred that were called together. Um, and what happened was that in every generation, as, as, as one uh, group in the Derevin had died out, um, there would be a, a second, uh, there would be a gathering of the Derevin and they would decide, okay, we'll give some of that land to so-and-so because he's got a young family and we'll take some of that land from so-and-so because um, basically he's lazy and he doesn't pull his weight and we'll hand it over here. And so in every generation they would redivide the Derevina land among the, uh, among the kindred. Okay? So it's how the farming worked. But farming didn't just take place on the land you actually owned. There was also commonage, um, which included uh, lands on the mountain lands by the seashore, rough grazing land, and so forth, land you use for bullying, all that kind of thing. And the kindred as a whole would have, would share that, would share that land, okay? And we can see that process, not just in Brehan Law, but also in, in townland names all over Ireland, where you have Balia e Kelly or Bali Kelly, the, the settlement of the O'Kellys, and that, that formula is referring to the Derevina as a group. Okay, they also, the Derevina was the, uh, the group that was used to calculate taxes. It was taxed on the Derevina as a whole. The Derevina was the group that decided, you know, provided men for the army, provided guards against wolves and pirates, uh, cleaned the roads, and were the responsibility in cases of feud or murder. If they had to, um, um, if a member of the Derevina killed somebody else, it was the Derevina as a whole who had to pay the fine. Okay? If you... If you ran out of Derevina, you then extended because life was precarious and the Derevina might die out, in which case you extended the liabilities first to the Irfina and eventually to the Infina, but very, very, very seldom. The Infina was absolutely, you know, you were really um, at the dregs when you were talking about the Infina. Yeah? <coughs> and my final point, because I can see Morris uh, wagging his finger at me, 
Um, my final point is that apart from these very definite legal definitions, Gelfina, Derevina, Irfina, there are also other people who are not related by blood but who can become kinsmen. And this is described in the Breton Laws. So we have the red kinsman is somebody who sheds blood, who is thrown out of the kindred. We have the dark kinsman, the guy who nobody is quite sure. Somebody, a female in the, in the Derevina has, has climbed out of the house one night and has had what's called a, a son of the bushes. And she brings him up a bit, and, um, and he does not share kin lands unless he goes through a, a ceremony of proof and he can either put his hand into boiling water or they can cast lots or whatever, in which case he will get some of the entitlements of the widest possible gin group. We have the kinship of invitation when people say, you know, we've we're really very little labor on the farm, we need extra guys, let's invite in that strong, nice man from down the road to join our kinsmen because we need bodies around here. Uh, so that's the kinsman of invitation. And then we have the grey kinsman, the son of, of a woman of your kindred when she goes off with a foreigner. Okay? So kinsman is not a purely genetic descriptor. They have to make allowance for the practicalities of life. Okay? So there are, even in early Ireland, there are people who are brought into the kin who are not genetically related. Okay, I've got too much in this paper, but the, um, going through the, uh, some of the other details, this is a word, kinyad, which is used in Scotland of a, of a clansman. In Ireland, it's used specifically of the Dal Gosh, okay? Um, and it's used in terms of defending the freedoms of the Dal Gosh and protecting Cashel from those nasties who live in the north, like the Enail. And again, my final, final point, sorry, Boris, um, the, the, uh, there is this high medieval uh, thing called the Kriacht, which is when clans, when, when chiefs and their followers move across the countryside, okay? And as an act of war, they occupy other people's lands and they, they, uh, they pasture their cattle on other people's lands, okay? It's like the fire, equivalent of setting the whole place on fire. And we have an example of this in the O'Donovans. These are the two branches of the people who, who controlled um, Limerick. The O'Donovans lived in Carberry. The O'Connells lived in, in, in uh, the west in O'Connell. But the O'Donovans moved in the uh, end of the 12th, uh, early 13th century. They moved into Cork. And you can see them moving down. And the area under their control grows much, much bigger by the year 1500, okay? So we see surnames actively moving in the high Middle Ages from one district to another. So my f conclusions are we read an awful lot more research in this area, um, but at this stage, unlike a lot of the uh, models that are used for Scottish clans, at this early stage, there is no evidence that large tracts, very large tracts of Irish land were occupied by individuals sharing a single surname. Small areas of land, farms were occupied by people sharing a single surname, but not large tracts. Um, and secondly, the relationship of all the multitude of Irish terms, it clearly was something very important to Irish people, the Finna, the Kennel, the Schlick, the Kennet, the Tuath, those, name, those words need to be defined, the relationship of those words to particular surnames needs to be defined, and the relationship of both to the Irish term slintia also needs to be defined. So please, everybody do Old Irish, and that's, uh, you know, we need to change. In, in order for historians to help ye in your genetic research, we need to do this research, because at the moment, we're a broken reed as far as you're concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, do we have questions for Cathy? Yep, we have a question here from Paul Byrne at the back and then there's the front. There we go. Yes, I wonder if you run, run across the term winter. Winter, yeah. Winter seems to be used in the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, it's used in early periods to be household. But in the 16th and 17th centuries, it seems specifically to refer to surveys. And, and, and it, it's, it's one of our best ways at the moment. We're going from Irish language genealogy 
into um, modern day therapy. Have uh, We don't know. Because yeah, most of the genealogies don't give us geographical location. That's one of the problems. Okay, we have a question here from Elizabeth. Munster Irish Project, for instance, there are a lot of surnames that are obviously native to Munster, but any of the records, any of the old annals or the old genealogical tracts that we've studied, has not necessarily identified a greater tribe to which they belong. And your early slide about the Sullivans and all the Freemen that were listed there, that's a perfect answer for that. <laughs> I'm delighted to see it. Well, there is, um, we've been talking about this, there is Eliz Elizabethan Fiat, which um, gives an awful lot of surnames at the end of, of, of you know, before 1601, and they, they may be our best uh, insight into the variety of uh, surnames existing in Ireland at that period, and they may be the way to sort of get in, because the genealogies were normally kept only for the chiefs. So looking at the Elizabethan fields might be a way in, but um, to finding the freedom. So that we have other sources like that. Is there anything earlier? Not on a regular basis. Most we're, we're very fond of aristocrats. Um, so it's the one there'd be the odd reference here and there. But the only thing I know specifically of a an early reference to a non-aristocratic family something from a text called Ogle of the Shinora, which is written around about 1300. And this guy says, um, you know, he's asked, he appears over the horizon and he's asked, who are you and where are your family and where do you come from? And he says, I am not of a Boara, a farmer. And he doesn't give a survey at all. And that's 1300. But it is a literary text and there's a lot, you know, it, it's traditional in form. So maybe by 1300, a lot of Irish people did do survey. But I haven't got evidence at the moment for free people, freemen and, and followers having surnames uh, at an early period, as yet, but I'm still hunting. There's a lot of uh, project administrators in the audience who run surname projects. What can we do as surname project administrators to help further research into this area? Well, again, coming out of the Munster Irish project, they have some very interesting statistics as to how many people uh, in the surname share uh, a lineage, uh, share a, a, a genetic lineage. Um, I'm interested in that from the other side. How many people don't share the genetic lineage? Um, because that might tell me something about when surnames were acquired. So, um, the more, in, let me into all your databases <laughs> and I will let have it. But I, I, I think that's, you know, it's, it's a partnership here. You're finding out, really what I'm trying to say is that it was geneticists gave us the model that surnames mean everybody's related. As a historian, I'm saying now that you've alerted me to the problem, historians don't agree with that model. Um, and, and, and we'll see what will happen as, as the situation evolves. So do you think that uh, uh, geographic projects like the Munster Irish project are going to be more important than individual surname projects? Oh, oh, well, yeah, yeah. We have a comment here from Barbara and then um, first of all, congratulations on a very, very interesting talk. And it's just a small comment, really. You commented on how important it is to for the research to be done on these terms and so on. And I would kind of even go further and say that anybody who's serious about researching Irish genealogy, surnames and so on, the Irish language and an understanding of it is really central to delving into whether it's townlands, uh, the relationship between surnames and so on. And you know, people get hung up on whether it's Sullivan or Old Sullivan and so on. Yeah, yeah. These are all just English translations. So. Yeah. Yeah. But I have to say, the Irish language people have to make, make academic Irish accessible to people who want to learn. And most, as, as somebody who's brought up in Belgium and tried to learn Irish as an adult, most of the courses are about how to order lemonade in the pub. And, and, and there's very little on um, how to actually investigate the language used in genealogy, for example. So again, we need to we need to establish links 
to the people teaching Irish that they will teach the kind of courses and the kind of Irish we need to know. We have a question from Patrick Kennedy. And I say, Coach, fascinating. I was on the channel of the class. I'd like to look in the context of your lecture to refer briefly to Schlott and uh, the, the advice that was given to the newly married couple, Schlott, Schlott, Herr Rock or Schlott, how relevant do you think that is in the context of your lecture? Can we draw any conclusions? Thank you. That's a translation as well. What is that? Schlott, Essentially, they say, you know, don't marry out of the family um, and, and, and keep your lands. I, I mean, I think the subtext is. Keep the land safe at home. Genetically, that's not a great piece of advice. But it means, <laughs> <laughs> it means much more than that. It means, uh, uh, it means make every effort to have a big family. <laughs> okay. so, Genetically, that makes more sense. <laughs> Debbie. In the early period, we have a couple of very heroic figures who are named after females. So, like King Connor Magnessa, um, leader of Ulster at the time of Cucullan, he is, he is the son of his mother, rather than the son of his father. But it's always the exception. And generally speaking, um, the role of women in, in our Irish society was always the role and they tend not to be recorded. And the only sort of format in which women are recorded in any detail is something called the Van Hanukkah. And the Van Hanukkah is really about the, the partners of men who produced important sons. So they're recorded not by virtue of their father's ancestry, but because they gave birth to a really important guy in exchange. So but that's, that's how they get in. They don't get in as females in their own way. Hi, Kathy. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk, and I think we're uh, at even on the surname uh, adoption. I have a particular question, particularly, say, in relation to the medieval period, the late medieval period, and the fact that, you know, uh, maybe people with Irish lineage, maybe Irish surnames beforehand and the like, the thing is, as the sort of the, the ebb and flow of rule English-speaking areas in Ireland, regalicization and the like. But this is like, there's a lot of scope for people changing Irish names to e English names, or or even re-adopting Irish names. Having spoken it, I I speak as somebody from a a, 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 a Wexford background, and Wexford is a classic case of that. Yes, absolutely. And I'm a Swift, and, and and my grandfather really hibernated in Ireland, and the are the foodies of, May, of North Mayo. And, and, and we have, we're a Walker family, we have no connection with them at all. But again, it's a question of alphabetization and alphabetization. And that happens in the early period. We have potters and potters, but we also have this, the, the personal name Dubberkey, which is a translation of otter, uh, suddenly starts appearing in the Viking period. And we have these other from uh, the Gavin, then coming from the so, so, but there's, we have to, Think of all the different languages that families in Ireland and all the, 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 the different things that happen in history and the way families cope with all the, the political differences. All the people we intermarry with. Yeah, exactly. Uh, One final comment from Paddy Wolf. I'm going to ask you to step out here away from the speaker in case we get um, a huge amount of feedback. Thanks, Paddy. Okay, thanks, Morris. Uh, thanks, Kathy, for a wonderful and very interesting talk. There's one other English word that I often wonder about. It relatively modern genealogy. It's the word friend. If you look at Aaron Berg and Kim's, Kimball's book on sociology in West Clare in the early 20th century, they talk about the distinguished, the distinction between relatives and friends. And relatives were the closer relatives, and you could marry the relative, but you needed a dispensation from the church. You didn't need a dispensation to marry the more distant relatives. Does all that have roots in Breton law? And, the different types of finna. Um, 
I didn't Dr. realize before. Darling Paddy, um, as far as I'm concerned, history stops with Brian Baruz, and after that it's journalism. <laughs> 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 the answer is I don't know. Captain Smith,